Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Well, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to be speaking about some of the uh, current business issues in China. Uh, try to give you a little peek behind the bamboo curtain of uh, doing business in China and some of the businesses that are there, Chinese businesses and uh, Western businesses uh, as well. Well, sit back, enjoy yourself, and uh, let's get rolling here. How many of you have been to China, by the way? Ooh, just a couple, huh? Well, this audience is a lot sparser than you usually find in uh, China, obviously. Anyway, um, if you're interested, I do have this presentation available um, on this uh, website. It'll be there for a couple of weeks. I'll probably change the name and move it around a little bit afterwards, but you're more than invited to, uh, to take a look at that. I've got way more slides than we have time, so I'll probably have to pace it a little bit and rush through some things and then slow it down for others, depending on what you're interested in. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. Can you read the cartoon in the back? Probably not. Uh, can you read it? Okay. We, re we refuse to change our unfair trade practices. We snub our nose at human rights standards. We freely, freely pollute the atmosphere. We sell poisonous food ingredients to you. We steal your intellectual property. We bootleg your CD and DVD releases. We're building up our military at alarming levels. That kind of says it all. That's, that's the outline for today. And uh, anyway, so here's Uncle Sam's response. It is an honor doing business with you. <laughs> All right, so this is kind of the gist of what we'll be talking about here today. We're going to survey the complex array of Chinese business structures that span global traders to local entrepreneurs. We'll cover that. Uh, the ascent of Chinese businesses and China's uh, extension into WTO, which bring both global opportunities and problems, and then we'll speculate about how businesses might be governed in the future. So uh, this is the outline. I'll give you a little bit of background contextual for those of you who are not familiar you know, with China, and then a little historical perspective as well. The point of the historical perspective is that nothing's changed. There's nothing new here. All the criticisms have always been there. China has always had a large population. They've always had trade surpluses. They've always been dominant. I mean, there's nothing new in the horizon whatsoever. Then it will look at different kinds of businesses, and I want to have you appreciate the complexity of the businesses there. And then we'll look at global trade, tech and innovation, and uh, local entrepreneurs. Constant change and opportunities, and then some of the problems. There are, we could spend as much time on the problems as the rest of the presentation, but I'll just look at, at a handful of key problems. And then the future. Then uh, we'll open it up for Q&A, and I've got some uh, resources as well if you're interested. Napoleon Bonaparte once said, uh, when China wakes, the world will tremble. Way back, you know, whenever. So China was always recognized as potential. Well, today it looks like China's w uh, waking up. And uh, maybe we are trembling. Should we tremble or not? Well, that's something we can discuss or debate later. This is a map of China. On the left here, Breakdown, there are 23 provinces. I think I've been to about 20 of the provinces. I've been through most of China sometime or other. There are four these municipalities. What that means is they don't report to provincial government. They report to Beijing. Two of them are up here by Beijing. Beijing and Tianjin are up above the bay. Shanghai is here. And the other one is over here. Chongqing's over here. Five autonomous regions, mostly in the upper west, northwest. You've got uh, Tibet's autonomous. You have Xinjiang, which is the northwest province, Inner Mongolia. There's a little one, Gansu, over there, and this over here. So those five provinces have a large minority population, so they're pretty autonomous. And then there are two SARs, SARS, different type of SARS, not the kind you heard about. But Hong Kong and Macau are pretty much uh, autonomous as well in a different kind of way. So that's kind of the breakdown. Now, what these spikes represent our population density. Cities in China are all multi-million, all right? I mean, any city there, we're talking about big numbers. So put it in perspective. The UA camp, uh, campus is about this size. Population of Albany is about 90,000. 
Imagine taking everybody in Albany and putting them on the campus. Now you got two options, either you go vertical or you go elbow to elbow, because you're going to multiply the, the uh, campus population fivefold. Well, that's only a fraction of a mile. Now, keep doing that as far as the eye can see. That gives you some idea of the density we're talking about. However, you can see the density is concentrated along the coast and then down to this Hong Kong area. Also, this is a bread basket. Sichuan province is a, a traditional bread basket and that's the home of Deng Xiaoping. So historically, that gives you a little perspective. We'll focus much on the coast. We'll talk about, you'll see Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen over here are the major cities that we'll keep referring to. I found this kind of interesting too. The population of China walked past you in single file. The line would never end. Forever. All right, so just giving you some perspective. Uh, the rest of these I don't think I need to read to you. Um, there's a the link here if you're interested. But the one I found interesting is here in uh, Shanghai. In 1985, there's one skyscraper. One. Today, Shanghai, you know, 20 years later, is a city of cranes, and I don't mean uh, the bird kind of crane, the, the building cranes, constantly building. Okay, now let's look at income. This is on uh, the World Bank categorization, looking at uh, GDP. Most of China, half of China, in the central and western areas are considered to be low income. Another quarter, more in the central and again in western or medium and low income at that rate. And then along the coast, we get more into 8,320, which compares to US median 100,000 at that 95 percentile. And then at the top 5% are the major cities I mentioned, Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. So those major coastal cities have pretty high level of uh, economic development and high income. But what you can see here is the disparity between the coast and the interior. And that creates a lot of tension, a lot of problems within China as well. In fact, a few months ago, do you remember when uh, the Shanghai stock market had a little drop, a 10% drop? Turn out that, well, a number of explanations, one of which is uh, the government said that uh, they wanted a lot of the industries to move into the interior. And if you follow the Olympics, for instance, when the government says we're moving steel plants from Beijing to the interior, it happens overnight. And so uh, they're trying to move a lot of the uh, industry into the interior to alleviate some of these problems. But you can see this uh, distribution of income is uh, you know, quite uh, pronounced. Deng Xiaoping is uh, one of their heroes, Times Person of the Year back in 78. And uh, in the early 90s, he said, I don't care if the cat's black or white as long as it catches the mice. So this is uh, in the transition going from uh, you know, communism into what uh, he referred to as socialism with uh, Chinese characteristics. What was interesting about him, he never had an official um, title. He was never premier, prime minister, president. He was head of the party, and he also was head of the military, so he had a lot of clout, but everything he wielded was more behind the scenes. So he's de facto in charge, but not as head of state. And you'll see Deng Xiaoping is pretty prominent in some of these changes we'll be talking about. 73, Deng Xiaoping, 92, Deng Xiaoping, that's a pretty big span. These are some of the highlights, I think, historically, the milestone events in Chinese uh, this transformation. 1972, Nixon visits, 73. Deng Xiaoping, during the height of the Cultural Revolution, still went out and tried to have these modernizations. 76, Mao dies, the uh, Cultural Revolution finally ends. In 79, they open it up by permitting joint ventures to come into China. 1980, they establish these uh, economic zones, free trade zones. First one was in Shenzhen, that city by Hong Kong I mentioned earlier. The uh, state-owned enterprises, which, which we'll talk about quite a bit, issued shares in uh, 89 Tiananmen Square protest. In 1990, Shanghai Stock Exchange. In 91, Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Again, the same cities that I keep talking about. Stock exchanges were open. Actually, Shanghai had a stock exchange uh, in the 1800s that was closed, so it really reopened technically. 1992, again, Deng Xiaoping 
call for in introducing the market economy, that quote I just showed you. He, uh, took, he traveled through the south, which was uh, you know, through Canton, and uh, they were pretty free. Traditional Chinese businesses, family-run businesses, and uh, he noticed the prosperity. So then he said, well, let's try to open it up uh, to the countryside. Let's uh, have towns and villages open up these enterprises. 1993, a law was passed that diminished the state's interference in state-owned enterprises, permitted private uh, companies, and they also had accounting standards. In 1996, they decentralized the uh, small and medium SOEs to the provinces, again, creating town and village enterprises. 1998, eliminated uh, direct control. They still have a lot of indirect control, which I'll show you. 201 WTO, and also more accounting uh, regulations. Oh, three, they started restructuring SOEs, permitting foreign companies to come in, take them over, change them, clean them up. A lot of changes, I'll talk about that as well. Uh, M&A mergers and acquisitions uh, rules go in effect. And then a couple of years ago, uh, easing entry of new businesses. So you can see in a span of, what, uh, 30 years or so, tremendous changes almost every year something else is going on. And so in this transition, they sort of tipped their toe in the water, try things out, see how things are, and then make changes. So from our perspective, we think they keep changing the rules. Well, they do, but from their perspective, it's they want to get it right. So we can see a lot of these uh, movement toward uh, more openness in the economy, but a lot of changes. So it's really hard to predict what's going to happen down the road with, with the legal side. Gesundheit, and you see China's market sneezes and the global stocks go crazy. So today, uh, a lot of, in a lot of ways, China's economy calls the shots for the rest of the world. Whatever they say, whatever they do, it used to be that when the U.S. sneezed, the rest of the world caught a cold, but now it's uh, China. We pay a lot of attention to the stock market. When the Shanghai market goes up or down, we have to we, uh, respond to it. Okay, here's another quote uh, by Landis in his book. He said, if we learn anything from the history of economic development, it's that culture makes all the difference. He studied Europe and, uh, and Asia, different countries, and that was his conclusion, looking at cultural differences as explanations for economic uh, growth and development. Let me uh, give you a little background of Chinese business culture. There are eight things I'm going to talk about. The first four here, Guanxi's personal connections. Now, we think of that as either nepotism or some kind of relationship, but it's a lot deeper. It's almost indebtedness. If someone has Guanxi, if you have this connection, then you know they owe you. You can, you can call in your chips any time. Moreover, Guanxi's uh, tradable, so whatever their connections are, you, know, you can have connections through connections. So if you have some relationship with one person and they have it with somebody else, through them you have this whole network of indebtedness of relationships. And that's important for business. That's really how business operates. Uh, and um, re relationship can occur for many different reasons. It might be your hometown. It might be same family name. It might be the school you, you went to. Some kind of connection is really important. Intermediary, it's important to have someone that's trustworthy uh, as a middleman between you and whoever you're doing business with. Social status is very important. You can always tell pecking order when you go uh, into a business setting or even to a business uh, dinner, a banquet, uh, by the way they sit and uh, how they interact with each other. Um, I had the uh, privilege of going with uh, the late uh, President Kermit Hall over to China a year ago, and uh, we had these big banquets, and Kermit was always in the middle with the party secretary next to him. I was always at the end, of course, with the waiter and the bus service. So. I mean, social status is extremely important, uh, and you have to really know, you know, who's who. One time, um, a bunch of us Americans walked into a banquet, and uh, they had a receiving line. The Chinese had a receiving line, and they were all lined up in pecking order, so you would know who was the most important down to the least important. But, you know, the Americans, we line up by who's the hungriest or, you know, whoever's there first. And we confused them. You could tell after a while they were just, they didn't really know who to give gifts to. You know, it was like very confusing. So social status is important. And harmony, interpersonal harmony, um, they never get angry. 
Um, my first year there, I went there a full year, and in spite of car accidents and sharp elbows and uh, trying to get on a bus and while they're getting off and so on, never had a fight. The no, first time I saw a fight was in Tibet, you know, and uh, so in spite of all the crowds, harmony, you know, they never get angry, they are always smiling, which also is very confusing because you know, may, they may be nervous, they may be upset, you can't really read, you know, what they're uh, thinking. Holistic thinking, um, you know, the yin yang up there, everything that's not, you don't have any opposites, everything exists together. You have to see the whole system together. Uh, for instance, uh, we think of heaven and earth. Well, they would say, well, if you don't have, or heaven and hell, if you have no hell, there's no heaven. You have to have an opposite. That, and everything is based on that, again, relationship and perspective. So you need the other end to know your own place. And everything is in relationship to everybody else, and especially uh, your network. Thrift, well, I think we understand that, uh, trying to you know, save, work hard. Face, again, uh, don't embarrass anybody. They won't embarrass you, uh, you know, either. Um, sometimes you run into problems. I've never uh, met anybody, when I ask directions, who would give me a straight, I don't know. It's always three blocks this way, two blocks over, and then you find out it's wrong, but they're gone. Because they, it's all about saving face. They don't want to embarrass themselves and just say, I don't know. You know, um, and then endurance, re relentlessness, tenacity, the work ethic, and I think we're all pretty familiar with that. The Grand Canal is just a huge, big ditch that was used for uh, centuries to get um, rice from the south up to Beijing, the capital. And someone once said the Grand Canal was built with millions of spoons. Just all these Chinese just by hand digging it. I mean, this is before we had big equipment. Anyway, those are some of the, I think, the important cultural aspects. What, what's past this prologue, what I'm going to do is um, look at some of the, I think, historical milestones to just make one simple point, and that is that nothing that we talk about China today is new. All right, It's just history repeating itself. China, first of all, might be the longest continuous major civilization, maybe. Now, they'll tell you definitely, but uh, the first 500 to 1,000 years is all mythology, so you can kind of, you know, forget about that. I mean, people with wings and that kind of thing, it's just, that's a maybe to me. Um, and also, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, area we're talking about is really controversial. I mean, greater China is really a smaller area than, than today. But that aside, they've been around for a long time, and so uh, you have to understand that uh, it's a very strong uh, culture. They were the largest economy in the world, and they had pioneered a lot of innovations. There's no doubt about that. So again, we see history uh, repeating itself. There's nothing uh, new here. Here's a list of Chinese inventions you're probably familiar with. I know when I was going to school years ago, you know, we always had this in school. So we're familiar with this. And um, because of this, the Chinese are confused when we accuse them of piracy. Because we don't pay royalties on any of this stuff. And if you go to museums, you see a lot of Chinese artifacts in museums that they never got paid for, you know. So if you think about it, these inventions that we've been using for centuries, you know, we kind of took from them too. So from their perspective, uh, they're not really doing anything new or different. This is a return to their trajectory. If it wasn't for the Western powers the last two centuries being in China, they would have always been ahead of everybody else. We kept them down for a short time. They're just taking their rightful place. The rightful place depends who you talk to, either by our side or ahead of us. And that's where we get into some difficulties. OK, just a quick romp through these dynasties. Southern Song Dynasty. I won't go into the north versus south, but there was a split. And in the south, um, this was during the time of the Western Crusades, but to put it in perspective for you. Again, a lot of inventions, the Chinese Renaissance, a lot of prosperity, but also decadence and infighting. They sort of uh, destroyed themselves. And because of that, they were weakened and it enabled the Mongols to come in from the north. So they were in the south. The Mongols came in from the north. They took over the northern uh, dynasty and then the southern dynasty as well. Well, Genghis Khan and Kublai Khan ruled the largest empire the world had ever known, from Korea parts of Japan, all the way to the Mideast, Persia, just about touching Europe. Their mistake was that they went south, and then they couldn't really sustain uh, everything. Now, this was the empire 
that supposedly Marco Polo visited, and it's a question mark because some scholars think he never set foot in China. They think he got as far as some prison in Baghdad or maybe as far as Persia, and he spent all his years in prison, and the stories he wrote about were tales he had heard from others also traveling through or being in prison with him. But anyway, um, the Mongols developed trade with India, Arabia, and the Persian Gulf. And again, the Silk Road and a lot of these things that we kind of know. But the point I want to make is trade, always about trade and prosperity for the Chinese. Then uh, the Mongols were overthrown by the Ming Dynasty. And during that time, there was this admiral that was an explorer, warrior, conqueror, diplomat, trader. Has anybody heard of Admiral Zheng He? The greatest adventurer the world has ever known. See how parochial we are? This is all about teaching Western Civ. Well, he took a treasure fleet, I don't know, a couple hundred ships, whatever it was, 1405 to 1433, led by his flag to the boat bound for the uh, galaxy. They went all the way down Southeast Asia, Vietnam and so on, Malaysia, through the straits over there, India, up to the Mideast, today's Mideast, down to Africa, brought back African animals like zebra, giraffe, and so on. And, and uh, they were trying to project power. I mean, that's pretty common today. We do the same thing, right? Get the Navy out there, project some power, try to get tribute, and try to get everybody to just uh, uh, obey your emperor. Well, when he came back, uh, this one emperor died, the next emperor um, who took over ended that, those voyages. He burnt the ships, and he forbade any double-masted ships to go out again. And that's kind of an interesting situation, and there's a little uh, debate as to why would he do that? Why would you have these adventures go out and then destroy the ships that brought back all his bounty and projected all of that power? Well, as far as bringing back, there are several explanations. One is they brought back stuff, not that he didn't like, but that he feared. Because if you're building a great wall to keep out the barbarians, you're not really so much afraid of being taken over by the barbarians because the Mongols just bribed the guards and walked right through anyway. What you're afraid of is being uh, taken over by new ideas. And uh, one explanation is that the emperor was wise enough to realize that exposing the people to the outside world might undermine him. That's one explanation. Another explanation is like we have in Iraq today, it's too expensive to have all these overseas adventures. You can't project power without paying a huge cost. And for those decades, it got too expensive. The third explanation is because of those costs, they were a little weakened again, just as a Southern song, and the Mongols threatened to come in again. And so the, this other emperor uh, started to uh, go north and protect the northern area, and going to sea was not a priority. In any event, um, Columbus supposedly read Marco Polo's book and he realized that uh, East Asia was a thousand miles bigger than everyone had thought. Well, if you're in Europe and you know the world is round and uh, where you're trying to go in Asia is a thousand miles closer, then you can probably hop over there by boat. It's a thousand miles closer. So that's one, uh, one explanation. Anyway, he uh, tried to find the sea route to all the riches. So again, we have the Orient, these riches, a lot of uh, trade, and I think uh, a big reason for the uh, rise of Western Civ is trying to go out there and, and do all this trade. So Columbus left the Mediterranean. Mediterranean, by the way, is Middle Earth, right? So if you're a European, you think you're the center of the uh, universe, but you're sea-bound, going west to try to go east. The uh, Chinese word for China is uh, Zhongguo, which is Middle Kingdom. And so everyone thinks you're the center of the universe, but here it's uh, ocean going, here it's landlocked, no ocean going. And so Columbus, again, trying to find the uh, riches of the Orient, discovered the US instead. Anyway, let's move on. So the Qing Dynasty, the Manchus, came in from the uh, Northeast, again, across the, uh, the Great Wall, was supposed to keep them out. They took over. By the way, uh, when the Mongols came in and the Manchus came in, in both cases, they were assimilated China is so vast and huge that they became more Chinese than the Chinese were. 
So the Chinese uh, attitude was always, let's just kind of pull back, we'll absorb them. And it was true, they became more Chinese. So the Manchus came in, and then King George, after losing here, sent Lord McCartney in 1793 to the emperor and brought more gifts. So rather than having the admiral fleet go overseas and bring back gifts, now we're over there, we're trying to trade. Well, the emperor had no reason to trade. He lived in the largest palace complex ever built, Forbidden City. He had more wealth than all of the European monarchs combined. He presided over this flourishing art and culture. And uh, he had peace and prosperity to over 300 million people. All right, so he really was not interested. So the uh, British wanted to have some kind of you know, permanent relationship, and they refused. And then the quote that is really famous that I wanted to show you is this. We possess all things. This is a response. I set no value on objects strange or ingenious, ingenious and have no use for your country's manufacturers. Again, rejecting these goods. Same old, same old. What was he thinking? Again, you can interpret it different ways. One was, didn't really care for manufactured goods because they were superior. But I think um, most people would interpret that as really he was afraid of exposure, afraid of new ideas, trying to preserve what he had. And so I think this is, again, more and more the same that we see today. This is the background of today. Well, uh, the British got into uh, this trade with China, and it was a big deficit. British like tea, Chinese make a lot of tea, and it was more than tea, but that's pretty you know, symbolic. And so after this, another century later, the Opium Wars. And that's really significant because the Chinese will never forget the Opium Wars, how, how this was imposed on them, and this is what happened. The British were deep in India, which is another emerging power today, I'm sure we, we're all aware of. India was growing opium. So they took the opium, they controlled this, forced it on the Chinese, and then took the tea from China to, the, uh, to England, to the British. And so this was a three-way trade that they imposed. So in the mid-1800s, opium wars, and a lot of rebellion by, uh, by the Chinese, and eventually forced the uh, Qing dynasty to crumble. By 1911, last emperor, Okay, so basically the point I want to make here is long history of surpluses. A little more uh, current. The Chinese market is uh, one of the largest in the world, but it keeps growing. China is the third largest trading nation in the world. And we are the largest trading partner, if you add imports and exports. China overtook Japan in R&D spending, which is now second in the world in spending for R&D, research and development. And uh, they overtook Germany for patents so the fifth in the world. So across the board, they're really doing pretty well. Statistically, you can see their population is about four times ours. Our GDP is uh, more than four times theirs. They're growing a lot more than we are. But look at these import and export figures. How would you interpret that? I think the numbers are kind of interesting, actually. First of all, they export way more than they import, and we're the opposite. And so we bash China for, uh, for this deficit, but we just are voracious in uh, imports, and we don't sell enough. We, I mean, it's just this obsession we have with importing rather than exporting. But, uh, but these numbers, these are both bigger than these. I mean, so they're just a bigger trader. And so again, history repeats itself. Back to the Silk Road, constant trade, import and export, and we're pretty much self-contained. We're a large, rich nation. We don't really have to rely on trade as much as they do. And to the extent we do, we buy more than we sell. All right? So anyway, just a little caution about China bashing there. Now, if we look at this here, the top one shows uh, foreign direct investment into China. And you can see it just uh, keeps growing. Now, in uh, 1998, 99, 2000, um, there's, a, there's a drop because of the East Asian financial crisis. I don't know if you remember that or not. 
little blip. But China didn't really feel it that much, and then it just kept, kept going up. And the reason for that drop is because a lot of the investors happened to be the other East Asian countries, like Japan and Korea and so on. So when they took a hit, they stopped putting money in, but they kept growing. What's also interesting is, uh, can you see in the far to right, uh, there was little red parts above the blue? All right, that's a financial sector. Prior to WTO, no banks were allowed in. No insurance companies were allowed in. It's significant that there are a lot of Western banks permitted in China. All right, I know that uh, locally, we've got Citizens Bank that was taken over by the Royal Bank of Scotland. They have a big stake in the Bank of China. Uh, more uh, recently, Bank of America has a big stake in another bank in China. So there's a lot more of this financial activity, which is important for trade because someone's got to exchange the money from Chinese money to dollars, you know, this and that. And so that facilitates trade. Down here, after that drop, you can see export growth, tremendous, tremendous. So not only does history repeat itself, but it's really explosive. And that's the situation we face today. So let's look at the businesses and find out why. These are uh, some of the countries that are putting money in, ranked by projects. Here's where the US is. But a lot of, you can see these are all proximity. Uh, Hong Kong, Macau are now part of China as well. This is for the first three months of this year, all of these. And here's where we rack up. Uh, here's Taiwan, they would say it's part of uh, China as well. So a lot of these are pretty much their neighbors or parts of China, except for the US and then we have the UK and Germany. So those are the big investors in China by country. Anyone familiar with uh, Sun Tzu, The Art of War? He's a major literary character. He was a, a general, he was a, a strategist, uh, very famous, uh, 453 uh, BCE, they think, is when he, he wrote this. And a lot of what he had to uh, say and write about is used actually by Western businesses as well, because business is like uh, war. Um, and so a lot of things he argued for back then for wartime is applied to businesses today. And the quote I found interesting was this, all wa uh, warfare is based on deception. And so when you do business with the Chinese, you have to be somewhat careful because they're not transparent, all right? Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying devious and uh, not trustworthy, but others you know, certainly would probably accuse them of that. But they're not that open and not that transparent. A lot of things, it's really hard to find out, and I'll show you some examples. All right, so let's, let's look at the types of businesses. Most important is state-owned enterprises, SOEs. SOEs are basically these company towns where they used to do everything from cradle to grave. So if uh, you, know, you worked for a company, uh, in the good old days you were told who you were gonna go work for, and they would tell you who you could marry, they would tell you when you would have your one child, they would tell you when you would retire, and so on. But you paid no rent, you paid no tuition, and uh, back then you also had a decent enough, I suppose, um, retirement without having to pay rent, and they, they took care of you. Now that's important to realize because uh, they're not set up for purely economic purposes. And so you can't look at them in terms of maximizing profits. They're there for social, political, and other purposes as well. So they go public, right? So now they've opened the economy. If you look at the stock exchange, 95% of the listings on the stock exchange are either SOEs or subsidiaries. And so you shouldn't think that the economy is really open up to all these small private businesses that are going public. It's still these dominant SOEs. Of that, the government owns or controls over 60% of the shares. Earlier I said that the government had given up direct control, but here you can see they still maintain a lot of indirect control. They've gone from command and control to shareholding control. I think it's a very interesting irony that they don't have to be uh, the same kind of owner's uh, position as they were before, because now they just own the, the, uh, the stock. But also with uh, very little of the stock in play, it's not a very liquid market. What does that mean? Well, it means that the price of these shares are not, they don't really reflect the underlying value of the stock. So when you see a lot of fluctuations, as we've seen even more recently, 
It's because a market is not liquid, it's not perfect, there are a lot of frictions. We have a small number of shares that are available to bid on. And so you're going to see a lot of fluctuation. Plus, there's no transparency, very little transparency, and the investors are not very sophisticated. So you're going to get a lot of spikes, a lot of variability in the, in the stock over there. So the remaining 25 to 40% are just traded on the market, but to make it a little more complicated, there are different classes of shares, A, B, C, and so on. A shares, Chinese only. B shares, for the rest of us. C shares, state owned these legal persons, SOEs, banks, they have legal entities that own C shares. H shares on Hong Kong, L, London, N, New York. So um, all kinds of different shares and where they're floated. It makes it even more complex trying to figure out how much does everybody own as I'll show you later, if, you're, if you own B shares, you may have a big chunk, but you don't get voting rights. So ownership and control, you know, the rights, property rights you have, they're very different. You can't go there as an investor and think the way you would do here as a Westerner. The rules are very different. And then the remainder are owned by institutions and employees. When they first go public, there was a 30-30-30-10 rule, 30% of the stock goes to the government, 30% goes to institutional investors, banks, insurance companies, 30% goes to the public, and 10% to employees. And after a few years, that gets traded, so that ratio changes, but still, the government is the big owner of the shares. And they don't trade the shares, they just sit on it. So the rest that's in play is gonna be these, and then a few others own it, but they may not really wanna trade it. Now, the government wants to take a large number of these SOEs and get rid of them. Reduce them to a core at 1,000. They want to have a global presence of these handful of companies and restructure or spin off, close down the rest. The problem is if they actually re-engineered all the inefficient SOEs, the unemployment rate would be about 40%. That gives you some idea of the magnitude of a lot of workers hanging around free housing, you know, and so on, free food, not doing very much. You know, the Russians had an old joke where the workers said, well, we pretend to work, they pretend to pay us. It's kind of the same, you know, in China. So let's, it really absorbs a lot of these, uh, the excess workers, and to understand why it's low cost and so on, it's land of surplus labor. So the government realizes this, and one of the reasons for joining WTO is to try to force restructuring, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little later. But say they want to reduce it to a core. However, there are a lot of projects and companies and industries that they still protect. The major uh, industries as they see it, uh, or the critical or pillar industries, these right here, are still going to be pretty much protected. All right. Now, put this in perspective, they've got a huge surplus, I don't know, a trillion dollars or you know, whatever, uh, whatever it is, uh, they're sitting on. However, before you go, wow, a lot of cash, about $200 billion in bank loans are not performing. Now, that's a technical term for meaning they're never going to pay. They're in default. They're, what, what happened is um, the uh, government forced the banks to loan all these SOEs money to keep them solvent, knowing they never pay them back. So again, this is the government being heavy-handed and moving money around to prop up failing businesses. That's a huge amount of um, money. If you take that, if you take the pensions that these people ought to get, that's another issue because one child, two parents, four grandparents, parents retire at 50, grandparents are probably still pretty active, one person supporting seven, person gets married, now one person supporting 14. Think about the implications for Social Security. If you try to really give them a, a decent retirement, they're probably another $200 billion, all right? And if you add up all of these uh, infrastructure projects, pollution, environmental control, all of these, you, what you'd find is that their surplus from trade would be wiped out. There it goes. So it's a very delicate situation. It's true they're sitting on a lot of cash, but they're also looking at a lot of liabilities down the road, okay? Anyway, let's move on. These are the largest uh, global Chinese firms, and I'll, I'll uh, refer back to some of them, but I just wanted to give you a sense of who they are. First two are petroleum, 
if you follow the energy market, you know, China, well, think about this. What would happen if 1% of the bicycle riders in China bought a car? 1% bought a car of your bicycles. Well, what happened to the price of your gas? It would go through the roof. Well, what happened to the air? I mean, I don't even care about bumper to bumper traffic because uh, there are thousands and thousands of cars registered every day in Beijing. I don't really care if they just sit still in, in, the, in the traffic there. I do care about the environment and the price of gasoline. And so if you follow China, there's a lot of political tension because the search for petroleum. The two largest companies there are petroleum. And I'm going to come back to the second one a little bit later. Again, energy here. To fuel this growth and development requires a lot of energy. So the grid, petroleum, <clears throat> mobile, communications, uh, you know, cell phones and all that, life insurance, Bank of China, another bank, another power grid, and telecom again. Several sectors really stand out, okay? What's really screwy about this is over here. I don't want to do the accounting stuff with you. The numbers make no sense. Absolutely make no sense. You can look at them till you go sideways and go blind. It's totally screwy. And yet, these companies are highly valued. They're the largest in the world. I visited a company there, a steel company. It's the largest steel company in China. It doesn't make the top 10. It makes the top 20, so it's still pretty large. It's uh, called Baoshan Steel. And I talked to uh, some of the managers, and they were boasting about how they're restructuring, they're innovative, and so on. They gave me the annual report. I went through the annual report, and I saw numbers that were just, uh, I mean, 1% or in the negative 2%. Now, asset turn, to put it in perspective, for a manufacturer in the US, should be more than one for manufacturer, not for service. Yes. When you say they make no sense, if you don't understand why they are the way they are, you suspect they're not really that. No, well, actually, both, I suppose, but actually, the former, more, uh, they don't make investment sense. If you see these numbers, you would never invest. I see zeros, I see negatives, I see single digits. None of that makes sense. So to put it in perspective, what I was trying to say was the asset term for manufacturer, so the first two, the third, uh, not the banks, but some of the others, should be at least one. You know, and so I look at the annual report, and what happens is the steel company was in all kinds of businesses that appear to be unrelated. Transportation, insurance, real estate, warehousing, uh, ports, and this and that. It made no sense, right? Well. The reason they were in it is because they needed those services to move steel around. So because the other businesses were not available for them, they had to do it themselves. The other explanation is a lot of times the government tells them to buy businesses. You familiar with Qingdao beer? Qingdao, most people are kind of Qingdao, Chinese beer. So they went private, well, not private, they uh, issued stock. And then they were told by the government to buy smaller brewers. So they don't look as good because they're, they're absorbing these failing businesses. So those are the two reasons. They're, they're told to uh, absorb the failing businesses, and they have to sometimes get into these businesses because that's the only way they can go global and, and do trade. So those are some of the peculiarities, but the numbers really look pretty horrendous. And yet, it's a booming stock market. Now, here are some of those companies I mentioned. Uh, this article came out on Forbes not too long ago. And it talks about these blue chip stocks on the New York Stock Exchange are actually in trouble. Uh, those are the first two petroleum companies and the life insurance company I mentioned. Here are a couple of other companies, but these are on the other list. And without reading it, they're basically explaining why they're in trouble. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there that just does not look good. If you go through this transparency and you actually get be behind it, uh, there's not much there. Turns out that New York Stock Exchange, a lot of these companies like to get listed because it's, it's a sign that they're transparent, they're open, they're legitimate. It turns out, though, that the rules don't apply to any company if over half is controlled by either one entity. Right? And so um, these top firms are controlled by the government. I mean, over half is the government, so those rules don't apply anyway. And so they skirt a lot of the rules. And so they just kind of warn the readers that for these companies, look out for these earnings. 
transparency, conflict of interest because they trade with each other and so on. So the, those numbers I showed you, you know, are really very suspicious. And yet these are some of the largest cap, capitalized companies that, that exist. So that was one warning. Now, let me give you another story. I sent uh, this presentation to a lot of my friends, many Chinese, many over there, one of whom sent back a story about uh, Warren Buffett. And he said, boy, I bet you he's upset that he just sold off one of those companies. And after he sold it off, it went through the roof. And I, I said, I'm not really sure. So I looked into the story, and here's what I found. PetroChina, in 2003, he uh, bought 13% stake for a 400 mil. Now, this is a company that explores in the Sudan. Now, if you follow in politics, you know the genocide and a lot of the controversy that China is uh, looking the other way on genocide so they, they can get the oil. So it's very controversial. That was one of his uh, first large global investments and uh, the highest profile. Uh, and yet, he bought 13% of the stock. He only had 1% of the voting interest. You know, back to some of these problems I mentioned before. Well, he just sold the last of his stock for three bill. He bought, he's paid 400 mil. Not a bad return. But what's interesting is this company, overnight, it went public. Overnight, the value tripled. One trillion dollar, this is the highest valued company in the world. It's double number two, which is Exxon Mobil. Also petroleum, obviously, because if you follow the price of oil, you know what's going on, right? And so that's why my friend writes back and kind of put my nose in it, tried to. I bet he's really sorry now. I don't think he's sorry, because uh, politically he had to get out of it. And also he thought it was at the height. He thought he got out just in time. Only 2% of the shares are floated. Somebody else has got 98% of the shares. And so when you have a lot of money sharing, chasing only 2%, of course they're going to ratchet it up. PE values are, are at this level in the US. 20 is pretty high. So they're really bidding up the value of the stock. Double ExxonMobil. And now they've got five of the most valuable companies in the world, some of which I showed you before, right? China Mobil, the bank, the bank, life insurance, and the two petroleum companies. So those companies I showed you the highest value in the world. But again, the stock price does not reflect true value. Transparency, no sophistication, uh, not uh, enough shares really floating, and, and so on. A lot of still you know, problems over there. That's the trouble with these Chinese stocks. An hour later, you want to invest again. <laughs> But that's a you know, very voracious appetite. You know, a lot of wealthy people trying to get in on something. OK. The other kinds of uh, businesses, town and village enterprises, when I mentioned uh, Deng Xiaoping opened the economy to local level, small and medium sized enterprises, this is what he did. He let these towns and villages create their own enterprises, bicycles and you know, things of that sort, very small local level. Family businesses, this is the traditional you know, Chinese business, the clan. Um, very entrepreneurial. It's, they've been around forever. And there's always been this problem with bribes, corruption, mismanagement. History has always kind of been like that in China. Then you've got this other five. You kind of counted all those percents I mentioned. 95% uh, is, uh, is controlled by uh, is, is SOE. The other 5% are these smaller companies. They're also listed. So, and I'll show you some examples. Entrepreneurs, small businesses, family businesses, town and village enterprises, uh, other 5% makes up uh, the rest of the market. FIEs, foreign invested enterprises. To qualify as an FIE, you have to have more than 25% of your investment from overseas. Now, once you qualify, you have certain advantages, you know, tax breaks, you know, that kind of thing, tax holidays. A little asterisk, as a result, the Chinese have what's known as a round trip investment. A round trip is when a Chinese company will take some money, put it in Hong Kong or somewhere overseas, and that same money will come back, pretending to be a foreign investment for the purpose of getting these tax breaks and other benefits. So the same money goes round trip. I mentioned transparency before, the lack thereof. I'll give you an example. It's really difficult to figure out who's in charge of these companies. I was talking to somebody once in Shanghai, and I said, well, where's the money coming from? And you know this deception I mentioned before with uh, Sun Tzu, Art of Deception? And they kind of dance around. They're not, never very direct about anything, very diplomatic. 
And he said, well, you know, we have an investor in Hong Kong, you know, and with this, we go around the bush for a while. Uh, well, where's that money coming from? Finally, it turns out it was like the mayor's son or something. You know, it's like there's always this connection, but they don't just tell you. And trying to draw these lines and, and connect the dots is very, very difficult because it's very complex. It's a shell game. It's a big shell game, but they're all really kind of embedded together. So FIEs, now FIE can take any of these primary forms. The JV is the original way. The only way you can go into China earlier, initially, was uh, by partnering with somebody else. That, that usually meant the Westerner put up everything, the Chinese put up very little, but got everything. It was not a very symmetrical relationship. And a lot of horror stories about Westerners losing their shirts. Uh, one, one example was they opened up some plant, and then the Chinese manager would, op would leave and then open up an identical plant across the road, having learned how to do it. And then the government would come in and for some bogus reason close the first plant. So, well, you know, you didn't pay your taxes or whatever it might be. So there's a lot of these uh, ventures that really went uh, awry. I don't think it's as bad today, but it's just something you got to be careful about. A few years back, they, op they permitted these wholly owned foreign enterprises or WFI, sometimes WFOE, wholly foreign owned enterprises. But um, these are, uh, I'll give you an example, Dow um, uh, or Corning. Corning opened up a plant uh, in Beijing. They were, I think, one of the first to go, open a greenfield. A greenfield is you buy your land, you go in, and it's all yours. You fence it in, and no Chinese are permitted to go in if you don't let them go in. And they, what they uh, did was they opened a ceramic factory. Ceramics is used for catalytic converters, a lot of automobile production in China, a lot of pollution in China. Of, so that's pretty good business, but it was strictly uh, Corning. All right, so no JV. Today, more and more of these wholly owned enterprises. Then you have different kinds of investment type companies. One is a direct investment. Let's say you already have a business there, you want to open up a subsidiary, you can buy an existing company or create a new company. Um, so that's a direct investment, but they're treated as a Chinese company. Also, investments can be a holding company where you go in as a foreigner, but you buy stakes in multiple FIEs. Why would you do that? One reason might be you think they're going to return a bigger bang. Well, what happened was uh, this was a way of trying to swap currency. So rather than go through a bank, you might have multiple FIEs and then trade currency just between them. So then you get a better exchange rate, because it's usually, it was pretty hard to uh, be able to get, convert uh, your currency. Not too many today, only about 200 of these companies uh, have interest in FIEs. And they still try to swap the currency.